Hi, and welcome back to yet another exciting week of the Lazy Money Game. In this week's episode, we have to talk about the financial news from the States, since not one, but two banks has collapsed during this week. So, obviously, the market has dropped significantly. So let's take a closer look at what has actually happened before I, at the end of the video, go through my portfolio as usual. So let's start with the first collapse here, namely Silvergate Capital Corporation. If you have never heard about this while you're watching my channel, then it makes perfect sense since they were mainly involved in the crypto space, lending out money there. And since that's not something I'm doing, I don't have a particular interest in this corporation. So why is this all of a sudden interesting to me? Well, since Silvergate Capital Corporation has handed in their voluntary liquidation paper as a Wednesday this week, well, apparently Silicon Valley Bank has some exposure to Silvergate Capital Corporation. So just to give a little more nuance to it, the collapse of Silvergate Capital in and of itself wouldn't be too hurtful for the overall financial market since you can see here that the market cap is below 100 million dollars don't get me wrong 100 million dollars is a lot but it is nothing compared to the overall market especially not in the banking industry but the problem of course becomes much more severe when we then look at silicon valley bank since you can see here that they had a market cap of around 6.3 billion us dollars this is many magnitudes larger than Silvergate. And at the same time, Silicon Valley Bank actually had deposits of around 175 billion US dollars at the end of 2022. But what I actually found the most interesting about this default of Silicon Valley Bank is that it is not due to speculation into the crypto market also some bad loans given to some of these new tech startups. It is due to the fact of a good old fashioned bank run, namely that the customers of Silicon Valley Bank is lining up next to their branches and are insisting to withdraw all their deposits. And on the 8th of March, the FDIC or the Federal Deposit of Insurance Corporation simply took over the control of the assets of Silicon Valley Bank. So why did the FDIC step in to take control over SVB's assets? They did this since SVB could not meet its financial obligations. Or simply put, the customers were trying to withdraw their money. The SVB didn't have the liquidity to hand over the cash to the customers. Hence. That is why the FDIC steps in. And just to put some numbers on this, at the end of 2022, SVB had roughly $175 billion worth of deposits. And within one single day, the customers was trying to withdraw close to $42 billion of those, meaning close to 25% of all the deposits. And the very natural question to ask at this point is, of course, when SVB is failing, should I now fear that the entire banking system will collapse? Or have we actually learned something from the financial crisis in 08 and 09? What rules have been put in place to try and prevent this from happening again? Let me try and explain and I'm sorry, this is going to be a bit geeky. So, whenever a business fails, it's typically due to the fact that they can't pay their bills, meaning they have a liquidity issue. Within the banking sector, you have this measurement called LCR. LCR is short for liquidity coverage ratio, and it is the high quality liquid asset amount divided by the total net cash flow amount over a 30 day stress period. Just to put a bit more words on this, what is high quality liquid assets? High quality liquid assets include only those with a high potential to be converted easily and quickly into cash. And there are three categories of liquid assets with decreasing level of quality. They are level one, level two A and level two B. So just to give an example here, 
Let's assume bank ABC has high quality liquid assets worth of 55 million and 35 million in anticipated net cash flows over a 30 day stress period. Then the LCR is calculated as 55 million divided by 35 million, giving bank ABC's LCR is 1.57 or 157%, which means that it will meet its requirement under Basel 3. Basel 3 sets out a set of rules, meaning essentially this fraction has to be at least 100%. And in this case, Bank ABC is clearly fulfilling that. Just to put a bit more words on this, the liquidity coverage ratio applies to all banking institutions that have more than 250 billion in total consolidated assets or more than 10 billion in unbalance sheet foreign exposure. Such banks often referred to as CIFI, are required to maintain a 100% LCR, which means holding an amount of highly liquid assets that are equal or greater than its net cash flow over a 30 day stress period. Highly liquid assets can include cash, treasury bonds or corporate debt. So at least we can see that something has been done in order to try and prevent the next financial crisis. But what are some of the limitations to the LCR? A limitation to the LCR is that it requires banks to hold more cash and might lead to fewer loans issued to consumers and businesses, which could result in slower economic growth. Another one is that it won't be known until the next financial crisis if the LCR provides banks with enough of a financial cushion to survive before governments and central banks could come to their rescue. So now that we know that the regulators has imposed some rules to try and prevent the next financial crisis, the natural thing to do is of course to take a look at SVB Financial Group's latest 10Q form. This is a 102 page long document, so of course I'm not going to cover it in detail. But the way that you would at least start your investigation here is would be to go to the front page here, then we scroll down a bit to go into cash and cash equivalents, since we can see that they have a total cash and cash equivalents of $14 billion as of September 30th, 2022. And at the same time, they had AFS securities of roughly 27 billion. AFS is short for available for sale, meaning this is high quality and high liquid. But where this becomes really interesting is if we go all the way down to page 92. So if we go all the way down to page 92 here, allow me to scroll down a bit, as you can see here, a wall of text. Let me just try to zoom in on the relevant paragraph. So on the bottom of page 92, we find this very important paragraph. As a banking organization, our liquidity is subject to the supervision by our banking regulators because we are a category four firm with less than 250 billion in average total consolidated assets, less than 50 billion in average rated short-term wholesale funding and less than 75 billion in cross-jurisdictional activity. We are currently not subject to the Federal Reserve's LCR or NSFR requirements, either on a full or reduced basis. So as you might have noticed here, the important word is not, meaning they are apparently not subject to follow these rules since this bank is not big enough. So now that we have seen the second biggest bank failure in the history of the United States, apparently they are not subject to following these rules. I presume somebody has done a really good lobby work, making sure that this bank was not covered by the rules. And just if you were curious about what NSFR is, it's short for net stable funding ratio. But since I feel that I am perhaps already getting too geeky here trying to explain the LCR ratio, I don't feel a need to explain that as well simply because I think I will lose your interest. But of course, I can leave a link in the description so you can read more about that as well. So hopefully you are still watching. I know that this was perhaps a too long and too technical description of what actually took place within this week, but I feel that I have to provide at least some degree of explanation in order to tell the story of what actually took place. And it is after all quite rare that we see two 
banks failing within the same week. But I still haven't answered the question which I asked earlier in the episode. Have I lost faith in the financial system? And the short answer is absolutely not. I believe that we have done, or rather the regulators has done a lot to try and prevent the next financial crisis. But when you are seeing a bank collapsing of the size that we have just witnessed this week, of course it will have severe ramifications as we have seen. The S&P 500 is down close to 5%. Is the market overreacting? No one knows. What will the future bring? No one knows. But have I lost faith? Absolutely not. So despite the fact that I haven't invested a single dollar into crypto, my portfolio is still significantly down, first due to a collapse in a crypto bank and hence the collapse of SVB. So let me give an update to my portfolio and see how it has performed over this week. So the first thing we notice is that there was clearly a red circle for this week's episode. If we go to the portfolio values tab, you can see that I'm down almost $13,000 compared to last week, meaning all the positive gains that I have had for the year so far has been completely wiped out. And now I'm actually in the negative by roughly $8,000. So this is once again a good opportunity for me to explain why it is so crucial that you have a strategy and you know what you are investing in. Since otherwise you might panic when you see your portfolio dropping more than 5.5% within a single week. And rest assured, this is not the last time that I'm going to see something like this. It will happen again, it's just a matter of time. But other than that, there's actually not a whole lot that has happened to the portfolio within the week because you can see here that the cost has stayed unchanged. Unfortunately, I haven't received any dividends in March so far. And if we go back to the overview, I can scroll all the way to the top just so you can see how each individual stock has been performing. Now you have your chance to pause the video and take a closer look at that as well. So very naturally, stocks in the financial sector has been hit quite heavily. If we, for instance, take a company like Uno Group, they are down more than 10% for this week. And I mean, this is where I am time and time again reminded of the words from Buffett that you should be greedy when others are fearful and you should buy with a margin of safety. So Unum Group, at least for now, it looks like it was one of the companies which I got right when I invested in them since I believe that we were significantly undervalued. And with the last decrease of more than 10%, I'm still up by more than 45% since my purchase. So that actually sums it up for yet another exciting week of the Lazy Money Game. So hopefully you have enjoyed the content and haven't lost faith in the investment world. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.